Yeah. Right. I'm not going to repeat stuff that uh, I'm just rapidly going to run over stuff that I said before about uh, the arguments regarding inequality and what's invalid about the inequality uh, discourse. The, uh, some of the view that inequality is this big issue and move on to why the inequality mania has gripped the world and try and delve into what might explain it. And as Garth was talking, I realized I have, well, I forget what he called that particular bias. I, could, I, I can only remember about 50 of his 75 biases. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the one in particular that I recall was the one that said, you settle for the first explanation you get, and you don't actually search for further ones. And I'm quite vulnerable to that. I'm aware of, of, that, of that problem. So uh, there might be explanations beyond, and I'm sure there are explanations beyond why it is that there's a belief that there's rising inequality and that it's a particular problem. In fact, people like Cameron and Obama, Obama and the Pope and many others say the biggest challenge facing the world. And this is really the big issue. It's now not uh, climate change off its pedestal. It's now the number one issue. It's going to cause conflict and destabilization and it's unjust and unfair and it's the biggest challenge facing the world at the moment, when in fact, as I have argued, and I'm just going to summarize briefly why I say what has happened is inequality has collapsed to uh, unprecedented levels and there's less of it than there have ever been before. And there's this weird anomaly that there's an obsession with supposed inequality when in fact there's less. And there's a belief that it's rising when in fact it's falling. And uh, now, uh, this is a... Statistical statement firstly, what, are, what does the data show? Does it show rising and substantial inequalities and not? And part of the problem is what's meant by the word inequality. So we'll, we'll, I'm just going to summarize that and then get on to why this bizarre phenomenon of presumed rising inequality as the greatest challenge facing the planet when it seems to me that we have declining inequality and that it's at the lowest levels ever in history. Um, how can this be? How is it that these two data sets can be believed simultaneously? And this follows, I think, very nicely after Garth's presentation. And uh, certainly Garth and Andrew, for example, are two people I would like to see uh, drill into this phenomenon and come out with what explains it. So if we start by looking at the uh, uh, the, the prevailing narrative is that inequality is excessive, it is called unfair, it is called un undemocratic, it is called exploitative, unjust, and so on. And, uh, and certainly by whatever definition you want to attach, it's said to be excessive. And I'm talking globally as well as within South Africa. So, and in fact, pretty much every country in the world is now said to have uh, excessive and rising inequality, including South Africa, and the planet is said to have rising. I'm going to talk mostly about the planet, not about South Africa, but I can tie it back to South Africa as well as anyone wants, in which I believe that it has been even more spectacular the rate at which inequality has eroded away in what I call <coughs> transformation denialism. The degree to which the ism has been transformation is actually quite spectacular, meaning lack living standards and incomes rising, uh, qualifications, literacy, degrees, everything, credit cards, middle class homes, etc., etc., rising actually quite spectacularly when the prevailing narrative is that there's a slow pace of transformation and nothing has changed and whites still control and own everything and so on and so forth. So there's this uh, strange empirical dis disconnect that the two quite opposing views are suggested by the data. How can how this be possible? Um, so if we look at the idea that the merit of being inequality is increasing, the superstar of inequality, Tom Piketty, says that R is greater than G, meaning the rate of return on capital or the accumulation of capital or the accumulation of wealth or income. And by the way, slithers conveniently from whether he's talking about capital or income or wealth, they're two quite different things as it suits him, but nonetheless, in the end, the rate of return on capital, meaning profits, uh, or dividends, is higher than growth, the rate of growth of the economy, 
I mean, he says, therefore, the rich are getting richer uh, at a faster rate. He doesn't say, it implies the poor are getting poorer as a result. The rich getting richer means the poor get poorer. This is the implication. But he's a good statistician, a solid economist, qualified, he's a high, you know, high level intellect, and you shouldn't just dismiss him the way people like us tend to do. He talks nonsense or whatever. No, that's not so. He's a serious, uh, recognized econometrician, uh, many published scholarly papers, he's, he's, he's regarded highly by his peers, and uh, he says our return, the rate of return, or the rate of wealth accumulation is greater than the growth rate, and therefore capital, or the owners of capital, the capitalists, are getting richer faster than the poor are getting richer, or that the poor might in fact be getting poorer. I'm going to go into the fact that the inequality junkies, as I call them, have no interest in the poor whatsoever. They actually never discuss them, they never analyze them, they never give you data on them, they never consider their living standards. They, they have a sort of extraordinary disdain for the poor. So, I mean, I think Andrew Kenny might even say they hate the poor. But, so they certainly ignore the poor and are not interested in the poor. Their obsession is with the rich. How rich are the rich? How rich are the whites? Whatever it might be with the capitalists around the world. South Africa just has our little microcosmic parochial view of the global phenomenon. Uh, so Piketty says R is greater than G, and uh, then we move on to inequality is conflict provoking. It is simply asserted to be conflict provoking. It is said that it's destabilizing, it's undemocratic, it's going to cause world wars and internal conflicts and riots and uprising and unrest. And then it is said that inequality is the world's greatest challenge by all sorts of prominent people, uh, academics, social science intellectuals. There is a, a, an emerging politically correct consensus about inequality being the biggest problem and rising. And I'm going to go very briefly into what the answers are to some of these before getting into why this phenomenon exists. Uh, so, so it is presumed that all capital is private capital. Now, this is quite an interesting thing. Uh, in the discourse, uh, in, in the, the Rockstar book, one of the biggest selling books of all time, uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, Capital in the 21st Century, which, by the way, according to research, I'm not statistically very sophisticated, but the best that's available, it is the most unread book in the world. Now, this is going to be true data. Uh, it's very big and very heavy, and it has been suggested the best use to which it can be put is to use it as a doorstop. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is the most unread book. It used to be Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, which is now Thomas Pickett's <laughs> <laughs> So many, many, many people buy it. We visited with Adrian Gore just last week, and he had a copy of it prominently placed on his coffee table, and I asked him about it. He said, I had the, just before I even asked, he said, I haven't read it, I just have it there to be pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> so he volunteered that fact. So I said, don't worry, uh, you are in the overwhelming majority of the eyes of the book. But nonetheless, uh, uh, in it and in the discourse, it is presumed that all capital, wealth, income earning revenue is private. How do they get there? Because quite clearly, if you look around you, there's capital in the form of infrastructure, schools, universities, hospitals, Parastatal enterprises, ISCOM, South African Airways, uh, and so on all over the world, there's a huge amount of capital that is not owned by what we call capitalists. And the way they commit this first sleight of hand is they say, oh, well, in, in fact, because national debt exceeds the assets of the state. No one knows what the assets of the state are, by the way. There are no data. Governments do not have balance sheets. Nobody has the slightest idea what governments own, except New Zealand, which is the only government in the world that actually has a balance sheet. So it's the only country in which the government knows what it owns. Uh, and if you don't know what you own, you shouldn't be surprised if you run it bad. This is one of the reasons why state-owned enterprise is bad. But anyway, all capital is private. The narrative goes on to say income from capital is inevitable, that it is unearned, and that it will continue exceeding the growth rate, and the rich will get richer and income inequality will grow. It is said that it is there's a distinction between labor capital income from labor versus income from capital, the assumption being they're two completely separate activities. In other words, when a pilot earns an income for flying a jumbo jet, it is not presumed that the income of the pilot is from the capital of the aeroplane, which is assumed that this is somehow 
separately, and this is standard econometrics, by the way, this is normal economics, is that the income from the labor of the pilots is simply income from labor and has nothing to do with the capital, and that the income from, uh, from for the owner of the airplane is, is not connected with the labor. It's not thanks to the pilot flying the plane, but it's just simply you own a plane and therefore you get rich. That's really, that's the that's standard mainstream economic econometric theory on capital, so-called capital labor split. And uh, inequality is about poverty and for the poor, this is one of the parts of the narrative. It presupposes that people concerned about it care about the poor and uh, that the income labor split, as I said, is mainstream economics. So let's look then at some of the part of the narrative. UNICEF, for example, says the world's richest people get 83% of global income, with 1% going to the poorest 20. And this is presupposed that that statement of itself, global income, remember this is not talking about rich and poor countries, big and small countries, countries with a history without, just this sort of this global income, as if there's this big pot somewhere. <laughs> and some people get more of it, and some people get less, and this is just simply wrong, you see, uh, without any conception of well, which countries are capitalist, which are socialist, which are old, which are new, which have natural resources, which have well, which don't, and so on. UNICEF goes on to say it would take 800 years for the bottom billion to achieve 10% of, again, global income, this cumulative thing out there somewhere. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with who produces it, who earns it, it's simply there. There is income, and, and some people are getting and, the, and, the, and, and for the poor to catch up will take 100 years. And then this is my favorite one, is, is their uh, concern about the disturbing prevalence of children among the poorest income quintiles, 50% below $2 a day poverty line. And I'm surprised they're in favor of child labor. They were distressed about the fact that child labor is earning too little. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, they didn't seem to notice that there's what some catch here. I'm still boggled by how the poor are going to survive 800 years. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Eugene Terrence said, uh, somebody said you've been discriminating against us for 300 years. He said, I didn't know any of you were 300 years old. <laughs> uh, this is this kind of idea, yes. Hmm. So um, then uh, what happened there? Oh, um, uh, that's just quick, quick, quick responses. The inequality is excessive. The answer is, is it unfair? Is it undemocratic? And the first observation I would make it is that with Hayek's point that if the result of a multiplicity of just transactions can't be unjust. There is no allegation anywhere made that anyone did anything unfair. But the outcome is unfair. Mm -hmm. So somebody sells groceries and becomes rich, Raymond Ackerman, Somebody sells software programs, somebody, you know, um, Musk sells Tesla cars and becomes wealthy. None of them are accused of having done anything wrong or have done anything unfair or anything unjust, but it is said the consequence is unjust. So as Hayek says, how can you say the outcome of a multiplicity of just transactions is itself unjust? But they do, that's what they say. And uh, they say that... Uh, uh, that it's undemocratic, and yet again, there's a correlation with World Freedom House views data on uh, economic systems and freedom and democracy, and the most democratic countries are the most demo the most capitalist countries, so, and they're the ones with the most supposedly unfair income distribution. So they say they need to get democratic control, is the phrase to be used, over income inequality. And yet, in fact, it is the democratic countries that have most of it. Uh, so, again, uh, uh, one of these anomalies. Then the response to the question of income inequality is increasing, or Piketty's R is greater than G, uh, is that all economists, all economists, pretty much most economists in surveys and have written about it, including prominent ones like Klugman and Stiglitz, who you would consider to be the friends of this view, have themselves said, actually, this is economically wrong. There is no reason to believe that R is greater than G, or that it continue to, to become greater than G, and in any event, we haven't even returned to the income inequalities there were in the interwar years. So why the sudden mania, the sudden madness about inequality when in fact and the, it's an inequality sort of obsession in the world? Um, then uh, the view that inequality is, in, is conflict-provoking, firstly there's concealed evidence, and I, I want to say I suggest there is deliberate malice over here. 
The easiest thing in the world is to look up data on levels of conflict and war and types of conflict in countries and to compare that with the inequality data. Both are readily available, easily downloadable over the internet. Everyone has access to them. One of the world's top econometricians, Thomas Piketty, wants that data, then it has to be deliberate in my view. Uh, that if he wants to maintain the notion that inequality is conflict provoking and he does not produce one iota of evidence to support that proposition, the reason is that it doesn't fit his claim. In other words, it is deliberately hidden from view because it, it would <coughs> contradict uh, the narrative and the process. But he does have some evidence. His evidence is Marikana. This is the first chapter in his book. Everything in the book is pegged on Marikana. Marikana proves that inequality causes conflict, people were shot because of inequality, and therefore we need uh, to redistribute inequality capital globally. Uh, and then he adds, just in case, because he ran after Americana, what else was there? Uh, he added Haymarket Square in Chicago in 1886, and for me, or for me, or however you pronounce it, in France in 1891. Now just look at how he's scrapping the bottom of the barrel. He's desperately trying to find evidence for the thesis that inequality is conflict provoking, there is none. The statistical data suggests it's not so. So he picks on Marikana. Now, as uh, Pete LaRue has written from Solidarity, that the story of Marikana was a turf war between rival unions. It actually had nothing to do with inequality. Uh, the, the Piketty narrative says that it was because of the high earnings of the mine manager. Now, the mine manager's earnings were never mentioned. What was mentioned was the CEO of the holding company, but not of the mine and uh, because of the, um, of the super profits of the, what he called obscene or excess profits of the mine. Uh, no, there was never any excess profit. It was perfectly consistent with global norms and in fact was falling at the time due to falling uh, crisis, uh, 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 platinum crisis. So it's simply, it's, that, that in my view is clear dishonesty. It's actually just un, unqualified lying and dishonesty uh, uh, we have there. And, and that is the narrative that is widely uh, uh, repeated. Inequality is the world's greatest challenge. Well, firstly, it's a bold assertion. There's no evidence. They just say it. It's a challenge. Why is it a challenge? Even if it were true, why would it be a challenge? Uh, and then um, uh, the flip side of this is the assuming that there will be poverty alleviation if they have less inequality. Not so. By far the biggest success stories in alleviating poverty in India, China, and on a smaller scale, Mauritius, but in India and China alone, we're looking at over a billion human beings rising as if by magic, suddenly after 50 or 100 years of stagnation and poverty, rising income levels on a spectacular scale, unprecedented scale, the alleviation of poverty has never before taken place, and yet it is said that income inequality is a problem, but you know, what happens in a place like China and India, inequality rises for a very obvious reason, I mean, it's simple arithmetic, if everyone, if 100 people are all poor, and 10 people become rich, there's rising inequality, so of course, when a country takes off, some people become wealthy, inequality increases, and that far from being a problem is actually a solution, namely a solution to the problem of poverty, that is the solution to the problem of poverty, is for uh, some people initially and more and more people in due course to become wealthy. Um, then uh, the assumption that all capital is private capital, it ignores all government wealth and it ignores all private assets. In fact, they go to great lengths to say why the fact that private people are all more wealthy. They have on a massive scale, unprecedented scale in human history. They own houses, they have uh, microphones, they have, uh, they have cell phones, they have um, fridges, they have uh, microwave ovens, they have cars, they have movie tickets, shopping <coughs> tickets, and TV and everything. Uh, this is all just written off. This is put as because it's for personal use. So it's not called capital, although it is wealth. So there's again a little bit of trickery and sleight of hand over there, although the poor are becoming richer on an unprecedented scale. We can make it appear if they aren't by simply saying their wealth doesn't exist. That's what they do. And if they get government welfare with hospitals and schools and roads and buses and infrastructure and pensions and so on and so forth, you simply say, no, but it isn't wealth and it isn't income. You just declare it not to be so. Mm -hmm. And that's how you maintain this narrative, this illusion mm -hmm. of growing inequality. Uh, then, there, then it ignores the, the rapidly changing fortunes of capital. 
capital is not inevitable, that growth isn't inevitable, that company, you know, the Fortune 500 companies notoriously, ones that were there 25 years ago, over half of them are not there now, the companies have disappeared, being absorbed, being liquidated and so on. So there is absolutely evidence quite the opposite, is capital is very vulnerable, very fragile, very easily destroyed, very easily lost. It happens all the time, big corporations disappear, get rolled up, get swallowed, get liquidated, and so on. Um, and then they completely ignore the null of incentives. Capital is just this thing out there. There's no talk about why do people accumulate it, and one of their big hates, of course, is inheritance. People who inherit capital are regarded as particularly evil and unjust. But why would the people have accumulated it if they can't leave it to their heads? <laughs> so, so the, the um, so they, this is ignored. Uh, income from labor versus income from capital. The income from labor is from capital and vice versa. The income from capital is income from labor. Uh, there's a technical reason why econometricians and economists have an income labor split and it's perfectly legitimate when you understand its purpose. Uh, but it's misused when it is said that the two split in some sort of bigger global way as opposed to a particularly technical economic way. And uh, quite clearly, as I say, the, the everywhere you go, the mine workers, Mary Palmer, their income is from the capital invested in the mine, and the capital's income is from the labor that works the mine. And so the two are two sides, very much of a point. Then it is said that inequality is about poverty, poverty alleviation. And now I want to make one of the big statements that I want to encourage everybody to grasp and to internalize is there is zero mention in any of this literature about what is actually happening to the poor. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever talks about, are the poor any better off? Now, when you start doing that, you actually decide, you discover that poverty has virtually been eliminated from the planet. In the 1970s, it was said that poverty was living on the equivalent of less than a dollar a day, obviously much of it is subsistence, so it's the equivalent of. And if you inflation adjust that today, it's something like $1.50. And the number of people then on less than a dollar a day was about a third of humanity, and now less than 10% of humanity. Yeah. And that 10% now, in other words, it's, it's gone. It's ahead of the Millennium Development Goals, by the way. They were set supposedly unrealistic extreme goals. The poverty alleviation by the Millennium De Development Goal measure has been exceeded, it's, and it's been done in the market economies. And it's interesting that nobody asks why. Where has poverty been eliminated and what, why did it happen there? And the answer was the liberalization of the economies concerned, the biggest economies, biggest countries, in populations in the world. Um, and then also the living standards of the poor have risen, not just because they have the equivalent of more than a dollar inflation adjusted a day, but because of technology. In other words, they have stuff that didn't even exist at the time. Yeah. The iconic uh, Maasai herdsman with an assegai in one hand and a cell phone in the other that carries all his money and, and he gives and arranges credit and so on and so forth. Uh, so that technology, uh, you know, and I can, just a little personal narrative, when I was a boy, uh, we had a Malawi gardener working for us on a small holding, some farm workers we lived on a little plot growing fruit trees and things. And uh, uh, this Malawi chap was our main sort of um, guy there. And the way he communicated with his family back home in Malawi, he was illiterate, so he would get uh, the children, that was us, to go to school to write a letter to his relatives and then have it posted. And that meant finding an envelope, finding a stamp. And maybe a week later, it was put in a mailbox. And maybe a few weeks or a month later, it would arrive at the village in Malawi where it had to go and be collected from a uh, some sort of country store in Malawi. And then his relatives would have to find somebody in Malawi who could read and could read handwriting as opposed to print. And that would usually be a nearby teacher or the child of some sophisticated person, a store owner or whatever. But it would probably be a month or two later that this letter was actually read by and reached his relatives. Today, every, there, there are in South Africa 75 million active cell phones, that is more than the entire population of South Africa. 75% of South Africans have active cell phones, some more than two. The 25% who don't are more likely to be elderly people, children, uh, people who, you know, just been on paper with using it and so on. But basically everyone who wants to now has telecommunications. 
that's just telecommunication. So now he can communicate at any time he likes, does regularly, with great ease with his relatives if he was still with us in Malawi. And uh, so the world for the poorest of the poor has changed spectacularly. At that time, they had no access to motorized transport. They walked where they went. If they were better off, they might have a bicycle or a donkey cart in a village. Now everyone basically has access to motorized transport. Everyone has access to when you go down the same road at about the same speed, and the one who's very rich might do so slightly more comfortably than the one who's not. And, uh, and so it goes. Uh, the biggest measure of all is life expectancy, that the poorest of the poor uh, are catching very rapidly up with the rich. The rich have always, in biblical times, lived for about three score years and ten, seventy years. That has risen only very slightly and very slowly with modern technology and health uh, uh, and wealth. And the poor have gone from something like 30, 35 years on average on the planet in the 1960s and 70s and are now in their 60s, heading for 65 and rapidly catching up. So living standards as measured by life expectancy, access to mattress transport, literacy, access to education, medical care, painkillers, telecommunications, everything you look at is actually converging. Uh, inequality as a real world experience is, is rapidly disappearing and measuring it with money, which again is a particular thing economists do, which is not telling you that people are equal, it's telling you about particular incomes, uh, is not actually a way of measuring the quality of life or living standards of people. And this is ignored. This is, there's not a word about this anywhere to be found in any of the volumes that are written about the supposed problem of inequality. Um, I welcome back. Yes, I am back. Uh, I don't know what that's telling me. Um, so, and then they are never ask what it is that it alleviates poverty where it is alleviated, and in fact the obsession is with the rich. They never talk about the poor, and then they only talk about some rich. They never talk about the rich who are celebrities, sports heroes. They talk about the rich who become rich because they supply things to the poor. Those are the evil people, the people who supply groceries and food and bicycles and clothes. And these are, that's evil. But if you get rich by being in a Hollywood movie or you get rich by being in you know, Tiger Woods or something like that, then, then it's fun. Then you can actually go and demonstrate for the Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street people in Wall Street and be regarded as one of them, even though you earn four or five times what the top CEOs mm -hmm of the so-called capitalist world. Um, so, uh, 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 let me just move on a bit, and we're running out of time. Uh, inequality is increasing. It's not if you look at welfare, and um, Piketty, I think I've commented, is, is simply wrong. Um, and I want to move under, on to just quickly defining inequality, and note that inequality is defined as the econometricians and the economists are to blame a bit for this because they measure what they can measure, which is money, dollars, rands. But nobody has ever said who went into things like the Gini coefficient that that's telling you about how wealthy people are, how well off they are. It doesn't measure that at all. Oh, a spouse, a child, a pensioner. Uh, are considered under the Gini coefficient to have zero income, even though they might be very rich and have the world's highest living standards. And, and so the Gini coefficient does not measure uh, 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 or the top and bottom decile's actual real world inequality. And then there's no mention of equality of rights. In other words, uh, according to the narrative, the fact that black South Africans used to be oppressed and then became free, they are not considered more equal with whites. In other words, the gain of equal freedom and equal rights is not considered a measure of equality, which is itself very, very strange. So when oppressed people become free, uh, there is no presumption of rising equality because equality is used as measuring money, not rights. And uh, there's no measure, the welfare is not improved. So all the people getting welfare grants are equally housed. And I'm using South Africa because we can relate to it, but same worldwide. These people who get welfare, the government is at the biggest level as it's ever been in history. Welfare is at the biggest proportion of GDP it's ever been in history. None of this is considered to increase equality. So it's, it's, just, include, it's just excluded from the measurements. So how can I be saying there's greater equality than ever before in history, and the junkies who uh, carry on about equality say there's greater inequality than ever in history? It's because they just simply exclude 
all sorts of stuff that should be included in considering whether people really are equal. Dependents are presumed of government or private families are presumed to have zero income, zero wealth, zero capital, so that Bill Gates's children are presumed poor. This is literally <laughs> the way that it works. Um, uh, wealth is assets are not included. So in other words, no matter if private houses and so on are not included. So if in South Africa we succeed in giving every black South African who now occupies but does not own a house ownership of that house, it will not be included by these people in the measure of inequality. They will be considered no better off even if they now own a house worth 300,000 rand in Longa Township that they previously didn't have. So getting 300,000 rand capital for free will not be considered a, a reduction of inequality as measured by the international inequality movement. Um, personal endowments don't say so. If you're young and gorgeous and brilliant or old and demented and weak, uh, in, you're considered equal if you have the same number of income rands, uh, which is clearly again simply nonsense. Uh, no account is taken of luck, culture, genes, history, something that Thomas Sowell is very, very uh, interested and obsessed about. Um, so, why then uh, the mania? Why the inequality mania at precisely the time when virtue when it's been virtually eliminated, the greatest accomplishment of humanity, the virtual elimination of poverty by any objective definition, and at that very time, instead of actually celebrating this fact, it is being the opposite is being said. The, 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 the opposite has happened. It's, it's an extraordinary uh, a paradox, an extraordinary phenomenon. Um, now, I think there is a psychological dimension here. As some people uh, always would like to think the sky is falling, people have a proclivity. I think most people have a bias in favor of bad luck stories. Crime is at an all time high, alcoholism, divorce rate. Sorry, I didn't cover that bias. Yeah, yeah. There's, 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 there's a, there's a, <laughs> no, there is a huge bias in favor of presuming the sky is falling. Anyone who says, you know, whatever it is, people tend to sponge up bad news as a, as a sort of default position. In South Africa is the worst on all of these indicators. The highest on this and the highest on that and the highest. But every country you go to, you go to Indonesia, and they say they have the most alcoholism, they have the worst crime, they have the worst child in life. Everywhere is going, sort of celebrates that they're the worst. It seems a strange point. Uh, but also, the point about it is that this is the excuse for Big Brother. It's, it's, you, can have, you can justify more government power and intervention in my terms <coughs> that if you come out being critical of the inequality narrative, it is probably because you're in favor of a, a freer society. It's probably because you... So it's got actually nothing to do with the data. It's got to do with your personal disposition is for freedom, so you don't go along with the things that are used to justify less freedom, whether it's environmentalism or... Uh, limits to growth or whatever it might be and whereas the people who want Big Brother, who want more government, they tend to latch on to and exaggerate any sky is falling story, anything that, that could go wrong that you need to be saved and rescued from. Uh, they, they love that, yes. Uh, just to comment on that, I, yeah. I would argue that at least 90% of people who identify initially as libertarians mm. also hold the sky is falling. Mm. They also see the government just getting bigger and encroaching. They've never looked at a map of freedom <laughs> over time. Yeah, no. the, and, and libertarians do that too. Right. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I remember no, I think the moment I switched. I, I think it is a sky is falling, but the difference is that to a libertarian government is the sky that's falling. Mm. And to non-libertarians, government is rescuing us, is protecting us from the sky. It's the umbrella that saves us from the falling sky. But even, even libertarians hold the idea that the government is yeah, now somehow more and tyrannical and than it was in Roman times. Correct, yes, yes, yeah. yes. And even though the actual, all the indices, Freedom House, uh, Heritage Foundation, which is very right-wing, Fraser Institute, which is libertarian, and so on, that all of these indices actually show more and more freedom and governments becoming more and more constrained. But by some measures, for example, percentage of GDP, they are indeed bigger. Uh, uh, but according to Piketty, if you measure capital, they're smaller. So, uh, um, and so people will latch on to any current card-like story, climate change, Cold War, 
uh, third world poverty, AIDS is a thing I disagree with Andrew on. I think it was another one of these hard luck stories from which government power and spending and budgets were necessary to save us. Global cooling originally, and now it's global warming. I was at university when global cooling was the big sky is falling scare. Now it's global. It doesn't really matter as long as there's a hard, as long as there's some terrible thing about to happen. Uh, the 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 dirigists of the world are happy, and it now just happens to be uh, inequality. That's in my view the big issue of the future. <coughs> the climate change story is now being knocked off its pedestal, and inequality is the big new narrative, the big new more power, big brother, Leviathan, and so on. And so the conflict which I discovered here in, um, uh, in uh, right here, this is, this is uh, uh, Urania's rugby team, by the way. You can see uh, uh, this is Urania uh, having the same battle of the, of the good versus the bad. Those are actually two brothers as well. <laughs> uh, playing for two opposing teams. <laughs> Serious? <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, uh, the widely inequality mania um, uh, when poverty is virtually eliminated. What's happening over here? I don't know how that happens. Jump back a slide. Uh, okay. There's what I call the inequality paradox. Is uh, it's it's the top concern of the world and the bottom problem of the world. It's a weird contradiction. The, 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 pro the problem that is virtually gone is now elevated to being supposedly the biggest and most serious, dangerous problem in the world. Um, my view is, by the way, I want to say about that thing of, you know, do, do does inequality cause conflict? Uh, this, is a, this is a fantasy of intellectuals and, 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 and socialists and communists. There's no evidence for it. I mean, do you, in this room, there are people who are much, much poorer than Christo Visa and Brian Benfield and Patrice Mazzetti and so on. Do any of you feel anger, resentment uh, about the people who are wealthier than you? Now, if I ask you, do people who are poorer than you feel anger and resentment towards you? Uh, it's harder to answer. My guess is no. I don't personally see evidence of it. So this is just purely an imaginary issue for intellectuals. Uh, and uh, I doubt if any of you go around feeling brooding resentment and anger uh, uh, and want to rise up against people richer than you. Uh, in, in this room there's some rich people like Ron and poor people like me. And <laughs> <laughs> I, do kind of, I do kind of resent him. And I, do angry and I do want to punch and attack him and picket and demonstrate outside his hotel room, but because I want to maintain the appearance that I'm a dignified person. Ron has problems of his own. He's going to go find a place to fuel his plane off. <laughs> and just think of his carbon footprint. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, just bearing in mind they are desperate. I think what is happening in the world is the people who want big brothers, who want powerful governments, are running out of reasons for it. They're running out of excuses. There's actually nothing they can say anymore. They used to be able to say it was to help the poor, it was to fight limit resources, global warming, whatever it is, uh, fight the Cold War. There's just no more excuse anymore for Big Brother. Wherever you've got it, things are worse. People are poorer. People migrate from countries with more government to countries with less. They migrate from countries with lower Gini coefficients to countries with higher Gini coefficients. So there's a sort of desperation, and that desperation translates itself into lies, and <coughs> exaggerations, uh, um, frantic behavior like, you know, Occupy Wall Street. It's a sort of like what is left for the people who want Big Brother and power and draconian governments, uh, because there's nothing in their favor anywhere to be found. And um, so there's an incredible appetite. I think this is just natural. People have an appetite for alarmism. If I can tell you, did you know that uh, uh, there was some farmer down the road over there who shot three of his farm workers because they didn't harvest fast enough? <laughs> People will tend to believe that. It's, a, it's a sort of like if I tell you some terrible, you know, did you know that there's more child abuse than ever before? People believe it. Now, the statistics show that there is in South Africa, but the reason is better data capture, and the people from the Department of Child Welfare will tell you there's in fact less. 
uh, but because of new methods of reporting and data capture, they are exposing more of it, and that fact alone is reducing the quantity of it. So uh, those of us like me, Pollyannas, who like good news and tend to think things are getting better, we see the evidence. I, Ralph will explain that I have some sort of bias. Yes, I do. I'm inclined to see and find and believe and absorb the evidence that things are getting better for most people in most places most of the time. And uh, most people are the other way around. Most people are inclined to think that things are getting worse for most people in most places most of the time. And I would argue they're just empirically wrong. And in order to maintain that narrative, they actually have to lie. They have to act so blatant lies, or they have, like, for example, government assets on capital. Or they have to conceal evidence, like, for example, places with greater inequality or have less conflict. Um, so there has to be subterfuge and dishonesty. Um, so uh, the, the real struggle is between liberty and oppression. That is actually what's behind most of this. And uh, there is a degree of disinformation on steroids. And I want to show you just one example of this disinformation. We hear about the rising Gini coefficient, rising inequality. The Gini coefficient is very high in some countries. <coughs> we suppose <laughs> have the highest in South Africa. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but this is the Gini coefficient if you look at it in the full graph. What they do is they show you the middle of it over here. Uh, that should give us a point of it, it doesn't. Um, without what's on top and the bottom. And in fact, pretty much all countries of the world are roughly the same. It's a little bit higher, a little bit lower. And uh, what you do is, this, this is one measure of inequality, the amount of money you get. Remember, this doesn't actually measure inequality in any substantive sense. Like, access to medical care, motorized transport, amenities of life, life expectancy, so on. This doesn't pretend to measure that. But note that it's not rising on average. So the whole Piketty thing presupposes some sort of hockey stick like climate change, but there is no such thing. It is just simply factually not what is in fact happening. So, um, so uh, what we have is what I call equality denialism, and uh, that brings me to the end of my talk, where I've suggested that the reason for this narrative, the big lie about inequality, is because it's a desperate search for an excuse for more power, less freedom, more government, more patronage, more corruption, more big brother, and that in fact it's really in that sense no different from any one of the others that have gone back throughout history excuses for more power versus more liberty. Uh, thanks for your attention. Even libertarians initially have that all, you know, they, they're typically like exposed to this type of information and then maybe the guy can let it go. I mean, I, I really think evolutionary psychology is like one of the weakest possible forms of reasoning because you can explain anything. You can explain why people are monogamous, you can explain why they cheat and using the same like set of arguments. But I, th I think maybe like from, from Andrew's talk earlier, my, my only difference with Andrew on that thing was I don't think geography was a factor, I think luck was a factor. I think society up to a certain point where we had a basic amount of information that we could maintain and pass along from one generation to another generation was quite chaotic. And I think maybe our impulse to think that things get worse, given you know if we lived in a primitive state, might actually have been quite helpful. We might have actually had a legitimate fear that things will suddenly go sideways, which kept us um, like alert, which kept us adamant, which basically we actually had to manage for a very long time to make, you know, to make sure that that, that it actually like kicked in and that, that things did progress. And I mean, if we look at like where the Roman Empire was versus where Europe was 500 years after it, uh, stuff like that, it wasn't always an increase. Mm. Um, I think the, the the increase and I think the reliability of the increase happened recently. No, I think I think that's true, and I, I, you know Andrew is really knowledgeable about this. But one of the things, much uh, as his talks are always uh, enriching and challenging, um, the timing is for me interesting. Is that since human beings, Homo sapiens, have been on the earth, essentially nothing happened, and then right at the end, very recently, in a few places, technology and writing and the wheel and so on happened, and. There's this idea that somehow some races, Chinese, Europeans, whatever, were brighter. No, it's just clearly something happened, whether it was climate or luck or 
or just one or two clever people or whatever, or, or good institutions, you know, maybe rule of law or something. But clearly all of humanity was the same until suddenly some took off very, very recently. And then we all took off. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, by the way, is the degree to which inequality is being stamped out. Mm. is that all of that technology, all of the writing, all of the wheel, all of the computers, all of medicine, everything is just mm -hmm. rapidly becoming available to all human beings on a pretty much equal footing. And inequality in any material, or substantive or meaningful sense has virtually been eliminated. Next is Andrew, then I am. No, oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you think after, after 30 years of marriage, I would have known that. A quick one, then. You mentioned various measures of inequality and equality. The one he left out was power. Power. Yeah. So if you look at a country like Cuba, in fact, any communist country, first of all, they've got a massive in, uh, inequality of, of income, mm. but a colossal inequality of power. Mm. So in Cuba, all power is concentrated in the Castro family, a little bunch of whites. And, and the same thing in, in communist Russia and so forth. Whereas in capitalist country, power, for example, to change governments, is spread widely throughout the population. Now, I would absolutely write, and I'm going to add that to my list mm. for my next talk. I seem to be, by the way, I've gone into this whole inequality thing in a, on a big scale because I think it's the big issue. So to me, this is, this is the new <coughs> frontier of debate. Yeah. So for me, it's I've done talks all over the world on it, and I'm planning to write a substantive paper. But I would say the point about the market economy is not only is the power not concentrated in the hands of one or a few, but is actually concentrated in the hands of consumers, which is everybody. Uh, market power is consumers, and, and they hire... I mean, I hire and fire the world's biggest corporations on an hourly basis. Uh, they, they are completely powerless in my hands. I have total sovereignty over them. Uh, they, they advertise, they do market research, they beg, they do everything they can to get my support and I hire and fire them mercilessly, they have no right to apply to the CCMA, there is nothing they can do, they are completely vulnerable and that is why they rise and fall so precipitously, you know, Blackberry versus Samsung, whatever it might be. Three quick questions. You mentioned they many times in your talk. Yeah. Uh, who, who are they, in your opinion? The, the they, the, 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 the organization. Do you believe that they sit around in smoke filled rooms dreaming up um, global cooling, global warming uh, inequality? And if you do kind of believe that, do you have any uh, clue as to what might be the next thing? Mm. After, the next after the inequality malarkey. Uh, yes, they are people who do meet in Sherwood Forest, right? Uh, no, they aren't. What I mean by they is an amorphous mix of uh, probably the only way to categorize them is left wing intellectuals. Now, mm. I hate phrases like left wing. Uh, and even phrases like intellectuals, because it includes journalists and you know, researchers for governments and so on, uh, what you might call, uh, I suppose, people who want more power and less freedom, pe people who don't like freedom. I include in that, for example, anti-smoking fanatics, people who campaign for more and more laws against smoking and liquor and gambling and now it's against salt and sugar and junk food and, and fast food and so on, and who want it regulated. It's one thing to be like Eric Pierce, for example, who goes around telling people and, and researching and studying what's healthy and not healthy living and food. Uh, in his calculation, he doesn't, as far as I know, include happiness as being healthy. So if smokers, if it's lacquer, I mean, I've never smoked, I don't understand why they smoke. Uh, but if they like it, or gamble, or whatever, then happiness is a, is a huge plus, in my view. Uh, but these are people who are Puritans, who hate happiness, they actually can't stand the thought of somebody enjoying a dog. But could, um, you, could you put a label? Is it the EU Committees on X? Is, mm -hmm. it, you, is it the Washington Post no, editorial I think it's, board? I think it's it? a mindset of activists. It's people who 
spend time, who propagate, who, who, who lobby, who seek power, who when in power want more control, more power. The Aaron Motswilleys of the world, the Thomas Pickettys of the world, who are obsessed with controlling other human beings and are particularly loathe and hate people who are successful as a result of having benefited the poor, giving them jobs and goods. So either who they are is, in my view, um, for lack of a better word, the left intellectual activists. Um, but that's a, I'm very uncomfortable having said that. Stephen? Uh, well, we'll no, just say the, the next... Uh, the, third part of the, the third part of the question was... Uh, what do you think is the next? What is next after... I, I have no idea. I, but I think there will be. Like all of the others, inequality will have a shelf life. Mm -hmm. Like climate change, it will eventually just be clearly nonsense and it will start falling in its traction and then something else will have to rise to take its place, uh, whatever it will be. I think it will be um, McDonald's hamburgers, maybe. <laughs> Obesity. Obesity could no, well be. No, it's going to be a health thing. Compulsory <laughs> exercise, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Right. Stephen? Uh, three things. Uh, the one is from Garth's uh, presentation. I just wanted to quickly ask, can we get the link to that bias questionnaire or test? Um, that would be very interesting <coughs> if it's an online test. I don't know. Like the calibration? Uh, yeah. yeah if you can maybe fine. share that for us. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I think part of Trevor's, the answer to Trevor's question might be the authoritarian. Mm. Um, just suggesting that. And then my people who want power. People who want power. Or who like power over others, who just like people, who like a controlled society. And I yeah. think that's a certain temperament. Yeah. And then, Stephen. lastly, I'd like to just maybe also make a suggestion. Uh, four years ago at uh, the Libertarian Seminar, I presented a piece on inequality. Mm. And I don't know if you guys would remember, but right at the end I said, if, if inequality was a legitimate argument and you wanted it, the best way to get it would be through the free market. Mm -hmm. So even if these guys did have a legitimate argument, mm -hmm. you would still say that the means of getting it is less government, mm -hmm. because it would lead, and we actually crunched up some numbers at the time, I think I'll double check them for me as well, and we came to the conclusion that there's a strong correlation between less government mm -hmm. and greater equality. <coughs> yes, this is the uh, Fraser Institute of United Freedom of the World online PDF. Where uh, in for earlier editions, not the very latest, there is a, uh, a graph showing the correlation between inequality and economic freedom. And it's pretty much flat, by the way. It's really, I think, not statistically significant. But there is slightly more equality. It's a slight improvement uh, with more economic freedom. The point I make is that were it the other way around, we'd never have the end of it. It would be rammed down our throats. So the fact that the actual data do not support the narrative means it gets concealed even though they all know it. And that to me is a very reprehensible part of this uh, intellectual movement uh, claiming that there's inequality is the, the obvious concealed, designed concealment. The, the data which they must know being the sophisticated statisticians and econometricians that are which they conceal. This, this, I think, is morally truly reprehensible. Ayanda? Thanks, Francis. Here are just two things. I was particularly hurt by the whole Pekiti thing, particularly as a South African, because he starts off with an incident that happened in South Africa. He has no clue, no understanding of how to And he's twisted it and put us at the top of the pile of the worst countries in the world. Secondly, I'm in the mining industry. I would like to propose to you that we do a book, maybe at the Free Market Foundation as libertarians or whatever, refuting Piketty or mm -hmm. answering Piketty. Yeah. Even if it's a thin little book, I yeah. really think as South Africa, we have yes. a pause here to defend and to fight back. Yeah. You know, but my second point, Leon, is, is a, it's a question that's on a related but not quite direct subject. I don't know, some of you probably listened to these series of talks called Intelligence Squared. They appear on the BBC. <coughs> And recently there was a discussion there about 
again, the pro-growth technology people versus the anti-growth, and you know, we'll never get anywhere. I call them the modern ludites, because literally they were anti-advancement, anti-technology, and their argument was, people like Bill Gates, Microsoft, and what, technology is causing the concentration of capital and power in the hands of even fewer people. Although their big worry was not so much inequality, but their big worry was um, that people would not have jobs. That these robotics and all this stuff is going to take away our jobs. And they even classify jobs that if you are a doctor or uh, I think if you take care of people, your chances are slightly better. They were trying to influence young people in their careers and all that. What's your view with this whole argument that, you know, with technology and the way things are going now, there is a greater ability of a person who, say, holds the key, whether it's a Microsoft or it's Google, whatever, to assist the whole world. I mean, you just talked about cell phones. Actually, we're all better off. But because they're providing that service, they are now evil because they got richer or become multi-billionaires. And its effect on jobs, uh, robotics versus what's your kind of view? Okay. Of Three points that I'll respond to. One is that, firstly, yes, I think there does need to be a response. Uh, I think it needs to be, you make it say, and I hadn't thought about that, it must be South Africa specific. I thought it should be global, in other words, uh, that the critiques there have been, a very, very fine one by the Chicago economist Deidre Moglowski, 57 page, it's called a review of Piketty, demolishes his econometrics, and even people like Stiglitz and, and others. There, there's a new big one came out just last week from the Cato Institute, a very fine theoretical critique, none of them address the bigger questions I've addressed. Like, in fact, for technological reasons, actually, yes. equality is yeah. rising. Yeah. So I think, yes, there yeah. does need to be a serious uh, heavyweight response yeah. book. And Maybe even a different index to yeah, measure. You're, you're quite right that actually South Africa itself has been elevated by Piketty to the number one example uh, and uh, you know, blacks are getting poorer, whites are getting richer, Marikana, all of that stuff. So maybe it should be somehow with a South African flavor, but still address the, the big the global points. Uh, then my response to firstly is that uh, I don't particularly personally, and this is just a personal emotive statement, care about whether Bill Gates or anyone is very rich. Firstly, they are not powerful. That is a complete myth under markets. They have no power at all. And uh, uh, the people who have power are you and me. We decide whether or not to use Microsoft software, whether or not to use an iPhone, uh, whether or not to drive a Toyota car, whatever. Toyota has no control over you at all. It is desperate for your support and your, and your power. You, you have power. I, I have power over the world's biggest conglomerates and companies when I decide where and how to fly, uh, what car to buy, what shoes to buy. What There's one true monopoly in the market, I think. And I think it's the only one, by the way, which is Zips. Zips. And I'll just demonstrate it to you. <laughs> I, did, I didn't really have an accident. But, uh, but nonetheless, there's only one zip company in the world, and no one ever talks about it. Um, it's just purely a market. Okay, yeah. Now, I would say that if all the consumers want that company zips, That's fine. if you interfere with the supplier, you're actually interfering with consumers. Yeah. And all so-called obsession with or objection to monopolies and conglomerates and market share and market power is nonsense. The, the, it is the consumers who have voted with every cent they spend for who they want the suppliers to be and whoever rises to the top of the pile if the market is free is the moral and right person to be there. Uh, and the virtue of what those so-called rich, horrible people have done is the measure of their market share and their wealth is directly a measure of the extent to which they have satisfied consumers more than anyone else has done. In other words, there should be monuments <coughs> built to them. They are the heroes of the world. They are the people who have found a way of being nice to me better than anyone else. So they are the best at being nice to me. Then the Luddite question is a separate one is will this mean that there's less unemployment? Again, it's very accessible empirical data. The degree to which countries are technology and capital intensive 
correlated with their level of unemployment. And the statistic is very, very simple, that the most technology-intensive countries have lower on average unemployment. In other words, it is simply factually not true. So it remains like most of these claims, bald assertions. They just say things. Technology causes unemployment. The fact that they never produce evidence means they have looked at the evidence and it contradicts them so they just pretend it doesn't exist because if they referred to the evidence they would be blown out of the water. But in a longer term more philosophical issue I would fully expect that a time will come when machinery and technology does pretty much everything human beings do other than give talks at libertarian conferences. So that'll, be about, that'll be about all that's left to do. Yeah. Uh, and in that, and that world will be a very interesting world. A world of social singularity where computers and robots are more powerful than humans and can do everything humans can do. I expect that to happen. People like Elon Musk and others are very worried about it. They're terrified. He actually funds research and would like to see it prevented because although he himself is one of the great technology leaders, he doesn't want it to go beyond so-called singularities, because he said then they will actually take us over and we will become slaves for them and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, but anyway, whether it's true or not, that will be a very interesting world, and I think we're getting there. When human beings are working shorter and shorter hours, the work is more and more congenial, we're doing less and less, and I would love a world in which no one has to work at all anymore <coughs> and in which the people who build and own the factories that make the robots, whatever, are obscenely wealthy beyond yeah. anything that Piketty has thought of in, his, in, his, in his most extreme wet dream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry guys, I've got a couple of people on the list, but we have to put it to that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so I think we're 